Hey, hey, party people. Welcome to my latest series, You All Asked. I finally caved. <laughs> I am starting a pattern making and sewing construction series on this channel. I am hoping to release one video a month in this subject matter, you know, shuffled in with all of the rest of my design and illustration videos. <sighs> I'm so excited. I'm like all out of breath. <laughs> this could be cool. This could be a disaster. We'll see. Whatever. Okay. So in this series, I am bringing in people who are way better at this stuff than I am to collaborate with me. So today I have... I'm Mariah Zaytoon. Um, I taught with Zoe at the Academy of Art. So she has a great background in construction that I don't have. I mean, I know how to do stuff. She's way better at it. <laughs> so I brought her in. This video, this first one, we're going to talk about tools that you need for pattern making and sewing because I thought it would be a great place to start and then future videos we're going to go over draping and pattern making basic blocks, sewing different kinds of seams, that sort of thing. Take it away. All right. Hi everybody. Um, so I know that you guys are all huge fans of Zoe. She's amazing. Um, we had a lot of students in the same classes and everyone loves her. Um, so I'm super excited to be here and just spending some time with you guys and talking about my favorite thing to nerd out on, which is sewing and patterning and all the little sewing tools um, and all of that. So um, I'm excited to kind of take you guys through it. Um, to give you just a little bit of background on me, uh, I've been sewing pretty much daily for about 13, 14 years now. Um, so patterning, sewing, um, draping, kind of pretty much 3D design is my world. For tools, the most important thing is um, having, having everything at your disposal where you aren't going to need to, you know, be halfway through draping and you've, you've set something up on the form and it's so beautiful and you don't have your pins nearby or you need to cut something and you're holding with one hand and you need your scissors. So you want it you want to kind of set up your tools ahead of time, set up your workstation. Um, and as my old mentor used to always tell me, um, especially with patterning, a uh, messy workstation gives you messy work. Um, so you want to kind of lay everything out, have everything ready um, before you get started. And that way you'll have, you'll have kind of a clean, easy work. Um, and you'll be able to really concentrate on the design or the sketching or the sewing or whatever it is that you're working on. So for me, I like to start with uh, talking about scissors. Do not mix paper scissors and fabric scissors. This is like a basic that every every seamstress will ever tell you like do not ever use paper scissors on fabric because it will dull them um, and don't use fabric scissors on paper. I always have a pair of uh, paper scissors so when I'm patterning and everything I can just cut out paper. I'm not not gonna touch my fabric scissors to paper. Just cheap, you know, drugstore scissors is great. You don't need anything fancy for that. For fabric scissors, um, you do want to invest in fabric scissors, um, and I have several different to talk to you about. The main difference with fabric scissors is not just the sharpness, but it's also that they're made to be flat on the bottom. So if you are cutting fabric, if you've got your fabric laid out, they run right along the table. So you're not kind of fighting back and forth. So you're cutting a really clean line. Um, which is really important because you don't want to have, you don't want to be cutting some really beautiful, expensive silk and have it snagging or be cutting jagged lines. Um, because if you cut poorly, you're, you're using your seam allowance, you're lining it up and you're going to sew it poorly. Um, so your seams are going to have kind of some, some waffling to them, um, which you don't want to have. So it's important to have some nice fabric scissors. They're nice and, um, flat along the bottom. A couple different brands here. Um, you know, I'm not... I'm not completely married to one brand. Um, I just believe in having really great, sharp uh, fabric scissors. So, on one second. Yes. I just want to tell my viewers that this video is not sponsored by any, well, anybody really. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I wish. <laughs> you want to throw some money this way. <laughs> yeah, so we don't have like a scissor company that's like, use our stuff in your video. So, this is all just her advice. Yes, yes. Um, this is just me freely telling you this is the goods. Usually my, my students, my entry-level students, um, you buy some kind of some pretty basic um, scissors in the beginning and then 
by the time that my students are kind of at senior year and they're working with these really fabulous silks and wools and furs, it's when you're working with that nice of fabric, you don't want to butcher it with some, some kind of okay scissors. So you go and kind of invest in the next lineup of scissors. So your, your entry level, um, this is this brand, I think it's, it's called uh, Mundial. Um, these are great. They're, they're sharp. They're good. I will say this. Um, I've had these for several years and um, they've gotten to a point now where the screw in it comes loose. So I'm constantly like using a bobbin or whatever to tighten it. Um, so they're good scissors, but over time they kind of do break down a little bit more. This one is also not very expensive. It's still kind of entry level. Um, this says Kai, Kai Japan. Okay. Um, and these, these I really like, um, because they're kind of lightweight. And if you're, if you are on some big project and you're cutting all night and you're spending hours cutting, you're not going to want something that's super heavy because your hand will get really sore. It's like the meaty part of your hand just starts to really ache. Um, and so having lightweight scissors is really nice. Um, and having scissors that fit your hand. When I've gone to fabric, um, fabric shows and I've met with scissor vendors there, um, they kind of look at the size of your hand and you buy scissors that fit your hand. I have a pretty small hand. I'm not going to buy scissors that are this long um, because it's going to be, I'm going to be struggling with it. So if you have small hands, kind of buy um, the shorter scissors that are a little bit more lightweight. If you, if you have a really big strong hand and you can handle the longer scissors, you're going to do less, less cuts that way. So that's going to be a better fit for you. So really kind of pay attention to that as well. Um, so back to the, the Kai. Um, these are good entry level. I've had them for years. They work great. Um, nothing, <laughs> no issues. And then on the higher end, um, our two brands, I am 99% sure that I'm pronouncing this right. Not a hundred percent. Um, Ginger. And it is, this is a really, really great brand of scissor. Um, it's a little bit heavier, um, heavier weight. You can buy them that are spring, spring loaded. When you, when you close the scissor, they spring back and open. So you're, you're using less, um, pressure on your hands. So if you're cutting, say you're spending two hours just cutting fabric, your hand's going to be sore. If you have a spring loaded one, um, it'll be less sore. Here's, uh, this brand is Fiskars. Um, and this one, you can see how it just springs back open. Um, so as you're cutting, it's going to spring, um, which just kind of protects, it's, it's more ergonomic for your hand. So those are great as well. Um, I switch back from my Fisker spring loaded and the Ginger, Ginger, something, something yes. that I can't pronounce. <laughs> Everyone on my channel knows I'm terrible at pronouncing things. Yeah. So whatever, They're, they always laugh at me, it's fine. But yeah, I, those are on the expensive side. Yes. So I didn't get a pair of those until after college. Yes. Like I couldn't, I couldn't buy these in college, them. I couldn't afford them. <laughs> I couldn't afford them in college. But those are really yes. nice. Yeah. But these are really nice. Um, and the same with Merchant and Mills. Um, these are also on the pricey side. Um, they're also very nice, um, really beautiful scissors. Really, even if you're even if you're buying the the lower end scissor, really for me, um, it's just keeping them sharp is the important thing. So whether you're buying super expensive um, and it's an investment piece, or you're buying inexpensive, especially if you're buying inexpensive, actually, you you really want to um, take good care of them. So you can take them to a knife sharpening company. Um, where you get like your kitchen knife sharpened or whatever. Um, and I mean, around here it's, you know, 10, $15, um, and get them sharpened. And so I do that, um, maybe every six months or so. It just depends on how often you're cutting and how, how dull they get. Um, it saves a lot of time too. It does. In the cutting process, because if you're struggling with dull scissors, everything will take twice as long. Yes. There's a lot of sewing drafting tools that you can kind of just buy the cheap version. With scissors, I feel like it's an investment that's worth worth making. Um, and as I always tell my students, put your name on it because your scissors will walk away. If you have really beautiful scissors and you're working in a shared studio, um, guard them, guard them, because um, they will disappear. Next up, we have our notcher. So this is for patterning. Uh, when you're sewing together seams and when you're when you're lining up your fabric, you're going to have little notches that indicate um, where things line up. So for instance, if I'm, if I'm making a dress um, and I'm looking at the front piece and the back piece of the dress, I'm gonna have notches at the waist seam and likely at the bust seam and at the hip seam. So I know when I'm lining up the two, um, 
the two pieces of fabric uh, where they have a little cut or a little notch, I'm gonna line those up. So I know that one side isn't getting shifted or stretched or you know it's not off where I finish sewing and I get to the hem of the dress and one side is a half inch shorter than the other. That means that your notches didn't line up. So notches are really important. So your notcher is basically a paper cutter, um, but instead of doing like a hole punch, um, it does a little a little notch, which is I'll show you the. We're so used to that word notch that we don't know how to describe it's, notch. It's a hard we all, to actually we all just say notch, and we yeah, don't like know what we mean. It's, just, it's just a notch, right? Um, and it's funny because this is this is one of those things that confuses students. I feel like more than like it, like they get the big concepts and the notch. They're like, I I don't really get notches. Um, you understand it more when you get in the process of actually patterning um, and then once you take it to sewing. So right now it's a little bit more of a conceptual idea until you until you see it in practice and you're like, oh, that makes sense. Now I know what a notch is. Um, so just trust me on this. Uh, when we get to our, our patterning and sewing video, you'll see me use our notcher. You'll see me put together notches in sewing um, and it'll make a little bit more sense. Um, but in the meantime, they're all about the same. I, I don't think there's a wide variety. Um, it pretty much does one function. It's, it's essentially like a hole punch and it just cuts a, a little notch out of your paper. This is important. You notch paper. You do not notch fabric. Um, it's something I always catch my, my freshman level students all the time trying to notch with fabric. You notch the paper and then when you cut out fabric, you use your fabric scissors and you do a little notch in your fabric. If you use your notcher on fabric, it'll it'll dull out your notcher. Um, and most of these are metal as well, so if your notcher does get a little bit dull, if you have, um, just a little insider tip, if you have a metal fingernail file, you can kind of file it um, to sharpen up the edges a little bit more, again. Which leads me into my next one. This We call these nippers. It's like little tiny um, little scissors that are great for cutting threads uh, when you're sewing. These are great because you they're really sharp on the end and you can get into the point of things so you can cut your threads really short. If I'm making a collar, for instance, you sew everything inside out and then um, you flip it. And so sometimes you have to push into, into the corner. Um, and so having something very sharp, I use this as a tool for pushing as well, pushing through fabric. We have our seam ripper. So this is gonna open up seams. I usually tell my students, this thing is going to be your favorite thing in the world and your worst enemy. Um, because if you're using it, it means something probably got screwed up. <laughs> so, um, but it's going to be your favorite thing because this is a lot easier than individually cutting every thread back open. Again, this is something that like disappears all the time. You want to have tons of seam rippers. Um, yeah, they also around. dull fast. They so do you dull buy, fast. If you can buy them like on sale in bulk, just go ahead and yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah. These um, these are great, and there's a wide variety of them. You can get little, tiny, short ones. There's a lot of different versions of it, but it's essentially it does the exact same thing. Don't waste your money on it. Yeah, those. This get is them like as cheap as you can. Just, yeah, just buy multiple cheap ones. As I as I mentioned before, I've been sewing for like 13 years. I still use this thing all the time. I still sew seams inside out. I still sew seams backwards. I still, you know, there's, there's no, there's no seamstress in the world, you know, that does not use the seam ripper. Um, so if you're using it all the time, especially as you're learning, that's normal. Feel okay about using this all the time because we all do it. Next up, we have an awl. So it is a super sharp, pointy, stabby instrument. Um, so this is great when you are transferring information from your pattern to your fabric. So if you lay out your fabric and you're putting your pattern on top um, and you say that you have um, darts, if there's any, <laughs> there's no darts in there. I'm trying to see, nope, no darts in there either. Let's say that we're working on a bodice, like a shirt. So you would have a side bust dart sometimes. If this were the side of your pattern, um, you may have a dart for your bust and you have what's called a punch hole. So a punch hole is going to be set in from the end of the dart. You're going to basically punch through the hole, through the fabric, or through, sorry, through the paper to the fabric. 
Um, so you're transferring that information. So if I hold up a piece of fabric and I see that little hole, I know that I'm going to be sewing to that hole, um, that that's going to be the end of my dart. So you actually want to set a punch hole in um, about a half an inch because you don't want to punch the very end of your fabric and then say that you're sewing to that point. If it's like a nice silk or something, it's going to leave a hole. You're going to have a mark there. Um, so you actually set it in just a little so that when I sew it, um, I'm sewing past that hole so it hides it hides that hole in the underseam. We'll get into that a little bit more when we, when we uh, do the demo of um, the draping and how to create a pattern from it. But, so we have a punch hole. We always circle those in red on patterns. This thing will stab through anything. It'll stab through leather. You'll be walking down the street. It'll be stabbing you. You don't want that. So my trick, wine cork, and that just keeps it protected in your bag um, so it's not, you're not getting stabbed, essentially. Next up, pins. So there's a whole range of pins. Some are very inexpensive. Some, you know, if you're buying fancy silk pins or things like that, it can get a lot more pricey. And by a lot more pricey, I mean, they might cost a dollar or two more. Um, but it is important to pay attention to what kind of fabric you're using and buy the pins that work with that. Um, if you are just starting out, if you're, um, you know, a beginner sewer and you're working mostly in with muslin um, or basic cotton. So you can kind of use any kind of pen. Um, if you are starting to work in um, very delicate fabrics like silks, like laces, um, things that are very sheer, lightweight, you want to use a very fine, very sharp pen. Um, so I typically buy silk pens. Um, the one thing I will say is, uh, I personally, I don't ever buy plastic pins, um, the ones with the plastic heads, because if you say that you drape something on the form and you did all these pins in there, um, this like beautiful drape, and you go to steam it or to iron on your fabric, if your iron touches a plastic head pin, the plastic is gonna melt and it's gonna melt into your fabric. So if I, I will spend the extra dollar and buy pens that have a glass head. So that's a personal thing. If you're buying plastic pens, great. That's that's totally fine if it's not an issue. Um, if you're not ironing anywhere near them, then, then that's fine. Um, but I just get in the habit of, of always buying the glass head pens. So even these that, that um, it looks like it's plastic, but it's not, it's glass. Um, so it's just something I pay attention to when I buy them. So here's a couple different styles we've got silver very basic um, basic pens these are great muslin denim um, cottons these are fine got these very very long pens are really nice um, for if you're like quilting or if you're working um, I try to buy the the thinnest sharpest pens possible um, if I'm working with silks um, or something very very thin if you use these very thin pins on something thick like denim, you can see how easily they just bend. So you wanna, you wanna pay attention to that too. So you're not just fighting, trying to get a pin into fabric. So you want a thick enough pin if you're working with thick fabric. Um, you want a very thin, delicate pin um, if you're working with a silk or something because you don't wanna cause a mark. You don't wanna put your pin through and leave a giant hole or run. That's why I have the yellow headed quilting is when I have, when I'm working with lots of layers of linen and denim mm -hmm. and you have to get through all those layers. Yes. And then for leather, I like binder clips. Yes. So these come in various sizes. I have maybe like a hundred of them running around the studio and I use those for leather. Cause I yes. you don't want to, you don't want unnecessary hole. holes in leather. <laughs> yeah. These are great. Um, and if you're working in a really soft leather, like a lambskin or something, um, where this might be a little bit hard on the edge, sometimes I'll put a little piece of tissue paper on there as well, so it doesn't leave a little teeth indentation on the side of the leather. Um, but binder clips are great for leather. Um, or if you're working with really thick fabric that your pin doesn't want to go through. Oh yeah. Um, then these things are fantastic. Also, you can buy a million different kinds of pin cushions. You can buy the ones that stick in here. You can get, I think this is one that can go on your wrist so you have it on you at all times. My personal favorite, um, which I personally think is just a lifesaver, is the magnetic ones. So the great thing about this is that 
if you're sewing or you're patterning and you have a whole box of pins um, and it falls off the table and then you're just down there trying to pick up every individual pin and you're stabbing yourself, the great thing about the magnet, done. I love it. I have, a, I have a Hello Kitty magnet in there. <laughs> <laughs> in that yes. little tray. Hello and Kitty. I just, yeah, and I stick all my pins. <laughs> yeah, it's the best. Y'all go get yourself a cheap magnet. It's worth it. They're not yeah. expensive. It's totally worth it. This one even comes with a little drawer. That oh, you can, I love like, that. I did not seen that before. Yeah. I typically have a mechanical pencil for drawing actual patterns um, because who wants to stop in the middle of what you're doing and all the, the patterning math going around in your head, um, these calculations and measurements, and like go sharpen a pencil and come back. So mechanical pencils are great with the exception of when you're working on a dress form. When you're working on a dress form, if you're, um, say that you draped this beautiful garment and you need to mark on there and you need to mark important lines or things, um, you never want to use a pen or a marker because it can bleed through the fabric and mark up your form. Um, and dress forms are pretty expensive. You don't want to have marker lines all over them. Um, and typically, um, mechanical pencils are too sharp, so they'll go right through the fabric and they'll mark on your form. So for those, I just use a regular pencil. There are like fabric markers that you can use for it. Um, those are great as well. Really, I just, I just use a basic pencil. Um, and when you're patterning, you always want to have good erasers. Because, you know, doing, doing a fitting, like even if I'm, I'm doing fittings on a model, there's going to be changes. So then I go back to my patterns, I redraw the lines, I'm changing it. So you, you don't want to have a pattern that you have halfway erased lines, you have a ton of lines that you're looking at, and the pattern's a mess, and you're like, I, I don't know, I don't know which line was, was the real end line. Um, so you want to use a good eraser that really erases your lines. Um, so it's a very clean, clear pattern, so you know what you're doing. I'm using a Prismacolor, it says Prismacolor Ma Magic Rub. Um, this is a great one, it's pretty pliable, um, works well. I really liked this brand, um, there's, I think it's Factus. Uh, this one's extra soft, I think they have hard, soft, you can kind of find what, what works best for you. This kind of kind of pliable eraser, this is great for sketching, it's great for um, working with charcoal drawings, not great for patterning. It's a little too pliable, it doesn't have the strength that you need um, in working with these long lines and erasing these long lines as well. This is a Pentel Click and I use that for everything, it's my favorite eraser. Yes, these are great. I mean, you don't need to go out and buy some crazy expensive fancy eraser. I mean, it's it's an eraser, you know. Just, <laughs> just get something that works. So when you are when you're draping on the form, you're gonna want to mark certain parts of the body. You're gonna want to mark lines on the body. Obviously, you don't want to draw a line on your dress form um, and mark that up. So instead, you use tool tape. You can get tool tape at pretty much any fabric store. It's a pretty basic. Um, it may be with the ribbons, the ribbon section. It's inexpensive, it's just cotton. There's not, there's not, you know, a lot of stretch to it. It's just kind of a basic, there's like an adhesive paper version as well. Um, really, I, I like this better because the, the paper version that's like sticky, the, the sticky doesn't always work and it kind of, you'll be halfway through draping and it comes undone. So instead, I buy twill tape and I just pin it on the form. So if I'm draping a top or I'm draping a dress, I want to mark exactly where the bust line is. You can see most forms already have the waistline. There's, um, there's the twill tape already on there. If I'm working on something that needs very specific measurements, like a, a pencil skirt where I really want to pay attention, then I would mark the high hip, which is about four, four inches down from the natural waist. The hip line is seven inches and the low hip is nine inches. Um, so I would take my tape, I would measure down and pin it to the form in those places. So then when I'm creating a drape and then taking the drape off and creating a pattern, I already have those markings on there. So I know where that's gonna sit on the body. So when you're pattern drafting, it's important to have good rulers. Um, I prefer see-through rulers because you're gonna to wanna to see the lines underneath it and it's gonna make things easier when you're doing your seam allowance. Um, you wanna be able to see um, your seam allowance is based on the line before it, so you're going to want to be able to see both lines um, through your ruler. I really like this ruler um, because it has both inches and centimeters. 
uh, which I find really helpful. When I was working in New York for several different designers, different designers use different different measurements. Some designers I worked with uh, used inches, some designers I worked with used centimeters. So you want to be familiar with both. So I like a ruler that has that has them on both sides so I can go back and forth. I particularly love the really long ones because if I'm if I'm making a dress or something, I'm not gonna want to use a little tiny ruler, <laughs> moving it along. You want to have really long, clean lines. One thing to pay attention to, when you're ironing and pressing seams, sometimes you're pressing a seam and you're saying, oh, I need, I need this seam to be five-eighths of an inch. So you're over there kind of um, measuring as you're ironing. Don't let your iron touch this. Don't let it get too close um, because these are plastic and they will melt a little. Or if you have it too near your, your iron when you're steaming, even if you're not touching it with the iron, if you're too close to it and there's steam, it'll make your ruler warp. And the last thing you want is a ruler that's gonna kind of warp because it's gonna uh, change your measurements. It's gonna change um, the way that you draw your lines. So that's just kind of an important thing to remember. I also use the, this is a hip curve ruler. So you can see that it's kind of this curved shape, which is really nice because guess what? the body is not straight. Even the parts of the body where it looks straight, it's not. I mean, the waistline, visually, it looks like it's horizontal line, but when you're looking at it on a pattern, it's actually a curve um, because our bodies are cylinders. Uh, when I'm patterning, I'm paying attention to the fact that your body, I'm gonna draw a line that curves out, then I would flip this because of the hip, where it curves down, and then as the leg goes down, you're curving back in. The whole body is a series of curves. Same with armholes, things like that. This is a really great ruler for that. Uh, the brand is Fairgate. Um, this is a great brand. There's also, let's see, it's what's like the this shape one? is the in same. Lance. I yeah. think a lot of these, the they're, shape they're is the same, but they, it's mostly, it's, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, this M Lance, this is a lot heavier, um, so it just kind of depends what what you like, but for the most part, the shape is going to be primarily the same. I don't think that there's a wide variety of prices or anything. I think it's just kind of a basic, yeah. this is this is your curve ruler. And then the see-through graph rulers, I think there's a bunch of different brands, but they're all pretty much the same. Yeah, they're pretty similar as well. Sorry, one more. Um, we have measuring tape, which is important when you're measuring on the body. Um, a lot of times if you're measuring something that's not necessarily straight, you know, if, if I'm measuring, if I'm measuring a straight line, like say a shoulder point, that's pretty easy to measure with a regular ruler. But if you're measuring something that's rounded, like say the bust line, you're going to want to use a measuring tape. You're not going to want to take a straight ruler and kind of try to walk it around the body because you're going <laughs> to get, you know, I see students trying to do this all the time you're not gonna get a real measurement. Um, your, your pattern's gonna be all over the place. You're gonna go do a fitting and you're gonna have like weird shape bust. You don't want that, nobody needs that. So what did you think? Did you learn like 800 things? I learned a few things back there playing student to Mariah the teacher. Please give this video a thumbs up if you learned something new today. If you want us to continue the construction series on this channel, leave your comments and questions for either me or Mariah. Be nice, she's new to the <laughs> channel, welcome her here. And uh, you know, share, subscribe, all those awesome things, hit the notification bell, and I will see you in the next video. I actually think that it's nice, uh, where I taught is not always the best part of town and getting out of class late at night, I always just felt a little bit safer walking down the street knowing that I had this in my bag, just in case. Let's let's uh, be real, that hood was gnarly. That hood was like, one of my favorite Sketchy. stories of like working in downtown LA, I remember my first job, I was an assistant designer, and I was carrying a dozen scissors to go get sharpened at the place down the street. And it was starting to get late, and it was starting to get dark, and I'm like, oh, I don't feel good about going this late. And my boss looks at me, she's like, uh, I don't mean to be mean, but you're carrying like 10 knives with you, I yes. think you'll be fine. Yes. <laughs>